start. Yeah, just move. Thank you. There, go. Go there. Thank you for joining us today. Good morning, everyone. We thank the Lord for this beautiful day that He's given to us. We love the Lord's day to live and to rejoice in Him. I uh, will be reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verses 38 to 44. And the theme of the sermon is the resurrection. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. As I've been talking the last three weeks about the importance of the resurrection. John, chapter 6, starting with verse 38. Jesus says, for I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of our Father who sent me, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up on the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. The Jews then were grumbling about him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then he says, I have come down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said to them, and he literally said, Stop murmuring among yourselves and complaining. Verse 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Let us bow our heads as we have a word of prayer. Almighty God, the God of our salvation, the God of eternity, and the God who sent his Son, who is the resurrection and the life, and so many other things, teach us this morning, Lord Father, to be obedient servants. Teach us to be more like Jesus, and teach us to worship you in spirit and truth, and let our hearts give to you all the praise, the glory, and the honor. We thank you for getting our brother Victor out of the hospital. We thank you for your grace upon him, and many other answered prayers, Lord Father. We thank you for that. We thank you for this day. We thank you for this time. And most importantly, we thank you for your mighty word. Oh God, let it work in us and on us and through us. In Jesus Christ, we ask these things. Amen. Just I hope you notice that uh, I do need a haircut and I do need a shave. The mustache will stay. It's been here since May 1970 with me. But uh, I kind of regret making a little promise to my grandson and his mother, my middle daughter, that I wouldn't shave until the virus thing was over. And uh, I tried to shave last week and they said, nope. He said he'd wait till the end until May 28th, so I have to keep my beard until then. And we will be resuming live services here next Sunday, May 24th, at Northfield Hills Baptist Church. Everyone is invited, and we hope to see all of our brothers and sisters, but uh, everyone will be invited. And as we look at this morning, Jesus is the resurrection and the life. I'll be reading from the Gospel of John. Chapter 11, verses 25 to 27. Starting with verse 23, excuse me. And Jesus said to her, and I'm talking to Martha and Mary. He said, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. And then he asked her this question. Do you believe this? And look at her awesome response in verse 27. And she said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, the one who is to come into the world. Amen. In the last three weeks, I've been teaching about the resurrection, why it's so important. One is part of the gospel, 1 Corinthians 15. Secondly, the resurrection attests to the deity of Christ, Romans 1, verses 4 and 5. The resurrection proves that we have forgiveness of our sins. The resurrection proves that God accepted Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, Romans 4. And then last Sunday, we looked at 
And Jesus' resurrection guarantees our resurrection from John, I mean, the book of Romans, chapter 6, but especially with verse 5, the first five verses, where it uses the word unite in the King James and the New American Standard Bible, but it literally, it's the only place in the New Testament that the Greek word is used, it literally means to grow together unto his death. So we have to grow together under the likeness of his death if there is to be resurrection life. And then the sixth one was from Philippians chapter 3, 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, being conformed to his death. If there is no death, there is no resurrection life. And that's what ties us all together. And Jesus is declaring here in the Gospel of John chapter 11 that I am the resurrection and the life. And the Jews were all, religious leaders were already mad at him because he's talking about I am. I am the resurrection. You remember, he said, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door to the sheep. I am uh, the bread of life and others. And what happens is they were really mad at him because they understood what he was saying. He was saying he was making himself out equal with God, but he came from God. Now, as we get to Martha and as Jesus is talking to her, now this is about just like people today and just like Martha. Martha had a general understanding and think of the resurrection that Lazarus, her brother, would be raised in the last day. Jesus was trying to get her to personalize this and to get her to understand. Just like when in Bible school and especially in seminary, more and more people that were studying to be pastors, they, they come to this theology, what they, what they call pan theology, where it's all going to work out in the end. Jesus doesn't want you to believe him like that. He wants you to believe, and especially this is about discovering who Jesus is. And one of the aspects, he is the resurrection and the life. He's trying to reveal to Martha and to all of us the importance of. That's why in that passage I read from John chapter 6, verses 38 to 44, he mentions three times in those verses that he's the one who's going to raise people in the last day. It's the power that Jesus has because of not only who he is, but because he is the resurrection. And it means more than just being raised from the dead. It means more than uh, just the end time period. It deals with who he is. And that's what Jesus wants you to do, to discover who he is. And as you think about all that he is, and he reveals himself. And in John chapter 11, he says, in verse 25, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me. In verse 25, the word believe is mentioned. Verse 26, believe is mentioned twice. And in verse 27, it's mentioned a fourth time. So within three verses, the word believe. And Martha, I tell you what, there are a number of things I could say that, that are not too good about her. But Martha, in this passage, she says some things, especially verse 27. There's no doubt in my mind that she knows who Jesus Christ is because she says it, and we'll be getting to those in a minute, but because of her faith, her belief, and now I'm going to amplify this, this is not just coming to a mental knowledge and understanding, but having that confident trust that Jesus is who he said he is, and not only the bread of life, the light of the world, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and all the, the scripture teaches. And so what happens is, he's revealing himself to us, because he is God, and that's why the resurrection is so important. And as you understand the resurrection, even this week as I was watching TV, and they had these theologians on there, and they believe, well, they're called so-called theologians. That's my, on some of these religious programs, on like the History Channel. They, some of them believe that the resurrection was written back into the Gospels after the death of Jesus, and years, decades later, that some of the writers did this. And because they didn't believe in the resurrection, and these are supposed to be Christian scholars. Well, to be a Christian, you must believe in the resurrection. You must believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of who Jesus is, because he's the life. And having that resurrected life. So in verse 25, he tells her I am the resurrection, and he who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And I want you to think, Peter, Paul, Mark, Matthew, uh, all the New Testament saints there believe this. The writers, the men and women, they believe who Jesus was. As we will get to more of this in a minute. They put belief in that. They trusted. They trusted Jesus. That's why, just like they're on the road to the 
Emmaus Road and after Jesus was crucified, some of them were losing hope because they thought Jesus was the one who was going to redeem them. And they were losing hope because of their short-sighted faith. And that's why Jesus talked about their faith. And that's why faith is so important. And in fact, in all those six resurrection passages that I preached from the last three weeks, and in this one, in verses 25, 26, and 27, about belief, having faith, not in yourself or how hard you can believe or what you can believe, but that you believe in Jesus Christ, who he is, because that's where eternal life comes from. He's talking about salvation. Even though you die, and all those people have died, and someday the Lord's going to come back, and it'll be our turn to die. But we will live again because we believe in him. Because he promised and guaranteed by his resurrection. Romans chapter 6, verse 5 verses, that because he rose from the dead, we're guaranteed to rise from the dead. And then look at verse 26. And it says, And whoever believes and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And that's the question. And that's the question that every one of us. Do you believe Jesus? Do you believe the scriptures? Now I'm going to interject in John chapter 12. Verses 24, 25, and 26. To what Jesus said. And I'm interjecting this because to help you understand what Jesus is talking about. He's talking more than just the, the, something about the resurrection. But he's talking about death. He's talking about the cross. And he's talking about believing in him. In John I mean, chapter 12, verse 24, he said, Most assuredly I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He's literally talking about himself. Because in verse 23, he's getting ready to be glorified. He just entered Jerusalem. He's going to, this last week, the eight days of Jesus' life, that's what John chapter 12 to 21 deals with the last seven, eight days of Jesus' life here on the earth. And he's just entered Jerusalem. His entry, final entry into Jerusalem. And what he's doing is, He's going to the cross, and he's going to glorify the Father by going to the cross. To the cross, and that's why he said he must. The grain of wheat must die, and he's willing to do that. But when you get to verse 25 now, 25 and 26 applies to us and all those. He says in verse 25 of John chapter 12, "He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life." And this resurrection life is talking about everlasting life, eternal life, that life that comes from God, that will continue on, not just in this world, but in the world to come and forever. And that's the life that he's talking about. So he's talking about losing your life. Verse 26, if anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, my servant, where I am, there my servant will be also. And he's talking about following in the footsteps of Jesus. Following him. Deny self, pick up your cross, and follow me. And he's talking about going to the cross. That's why that passage, all those passages that I have been preaching upon are so important to deal with the resurrection. Because it's also being united, as Romans 6, 5 says, being growing together in his death. So as Jesus is getting as he's carrying his cross and marching forward and taking step by step toward the cross, we must do the same thing. We must pick up our cross, and that's what he's teaching here. If you're going to be a servant, you're going to have to deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. You've got to follow in his footsteps, and that's what God expects of all of us. Those who claim to be his servant, those who claim to be Christians, those who claim to love the Lord, we must follow in his footsteps. And some days, it is definitely harder than others. You make a decision, but it's a decision you have to make every day because God will use you and he will glorify you. And that's what he says in the last part of verse 26. And if anyone serves me, my Father will honor him because just as Jesus in verse 23 says, I will, the Father will glorify me because he's going in the steps, he's doing the will of the Father. That's what Jesus Christ came to do. That's what our will should be. Not to do our will, but to do the will of him who sent me. That's why Jesus said in John 3.30, he must increase and we must decrease. 
And the only way that can happen is through Jesus Christ and the power of God's Word and the power of God's Holy Spirit working in us and on us and through us to make us warm. What was last week's sixth point in Philippians 3 10? That I may know Him, the power of His resurrection, and be conformed to His the fellowship of suffering, and be conformed to His death. That happens when we're willing to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. Walk every day, take those. Put our foot in the same steps that Jesus took going to the cross because it is obedience to God and to his will. That's what he came to do. And I hope as a Christian and as you serve him, you learn that that's what the Christian life is. It's about following in his footsteps. And sometimes it's hard. Just like when we have snow. I live in Troy and we have a trampoline in our backyard. My grandson uses it. A few other people use it. And there'll be sometimes when we have six, seven inches, I use the roof rake and I, and as I walk around, I try to walk in the same footsteps as I made so that as I scrape the, the huge amount of snow off, and it is hard sometimes, most of the time it is hard, trying to walk in the same, same footprints that I have made so I don't get snow on my shoe and everything else. But it is hard. And just like, but Jesus expects that of us. To serve him, to love him, to know him, to nice up, pick up the cross and follow him. And that's what he's saying here in John chapter 12, verses 24, 25, and 26. So now let's tie this up over to, to chapter 11, verse 27, because Jesus asked Martha, Do you believe this? I love that. And look at her response in verse 27. I mean, verse 27, and she said to him, Notice the very first thing. Yes, Lord. She calls him Lord. That lets you know, and that's what all of us have to do. We learn Jesus is Lord. That means he is Lord and Savior. He is the Master. We cannot tell the Master what to do, but remember, Mark, remember, try to tell Jesus what to do with that. And it happens. And people today try to tell Jesus. He is Lord. He tells us what to do. So the very first thing is she says, yes, Lord. She acknowledges him as Lord. Second thing she says in verse 27, I believe that you are the Christ, the Christ, the Messiah, the one who is to come, as we will see, the Christ, the one sent from God, and what was the Messiah to save his people, and to redeem his people, redemption. That's why the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus is so important, because that's how he, he redeemed us. He redeemed us from the marketplace of the world, the sin, death, and the law. Think about it. You either serve in righteousness or serve in the sin. You can't be both. And there are Christians and so-called Christians who try to play one foot in heaven and one foot someplace else. You can't do it. You either follow in the footsteps of Jesus or you're following in your own footsteps. And she says, you are the Christ. Look at the third thing she says. The Son of God. And man, that was and that is one of the problems in all the I am statements and a number of other things that the religious leaders had problems. She acknowledges Jesus is the Son of God. And that's why the resurrection, Romans 1, 4, and 5, attests to the deity of Christ. That means it's that landmark. It's that arrow that's pointing. He is God. She understood that because she very clarifies it in Scripture. I believe that you are the Son of God. And there are people today, even some preachers, so-called preachers, I'm not sure what to call them, they're not sure who Jesus is. Jesus is very clear because he's describing who he is. And this is so important because he is God. He's revealing himself. As John, in the first chapter of his gospel, he's explaining who God is to who he is. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And man, the religious leaders, and even people today, Sometimes when I'm talking to somebody about the Lord and, and sharing the gospel, I get to the, sometimes I've got to cut through a lot of things, and I just tell them Jesus is God. And that lets me know, through all the smoke that they're putting up, and they'll just, no, yes, they'll just come off flat. And I said, well, to be a Christian, you must believe that. And uh, they have trouble, a number of people, and a number of religions have trouble with that. He is the Son of God. That's the third thing she says. And look at the fourth thing she says in verse 27. The one who is to come. Notice, he's Lord, the 
Christ, the Son of God, is the one who is to come into the world. That goes with the incarnation. That goes with the Christmas story. Now, the scripture doesn't teach the December 25th. It doesn't say. But one thing we do know is that he was born. He came into this world. That deals with the incarnation. So if you don't like December 25th, you tell me what day you like. Because he did come into this world. He came into this world to be born in the manger. And God sent him. This was God's plan from before the foundations of the world. And the one who came into the world to deal with the incarnation. For God becomes man. Fully God and fully man. And people do have a problem with that. But for me and for those of us who believe, it's easy. We believe because we trust God and we take God out of his word. And that's why that word belief is mentioned four times in three verses here. Belief. Belief in God and who he is and what he said. That's why the word of God, just like in 1 Corinthians 15, according to the scripture, he died on the cross for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. That's why the scriptures are so important. We take God at his word and believe God. And as we look to him in our faith and as we trust. And, then, and you, this is a clear, great picture that Martha definitely believes who Jesus was. He's Lord, he's Christ, the Son of God, and the one who is to come. And I tell you what, man, and that's what we as Christians Martha knew exactly what to say and she knew what to believe because she believed it. Now, did she understand everything about the resurrection and everything? No, she did, just like a lot of us don't today. But as we study and as we learn, just like the book of Jeremiah 9, 23, 24, he says, don't brag about your riches, your power, your money. When he says, when you're given a boast, boast in this, that you know me and understand me. And one of the things you can understand is that God sent his son into the world. He humbled himself. He became man. We can understand that because that deals with God's forgiveness, the forgiveness of our sins and his righteousness. And there are times, there are times we're not sure. That's why when you look at these answers, when she said, Jesus is, he says, your Lord. That means he's the master. He's the one in charge. And I still remember, and at times it, it doesn't happen much anymore because I have learned learned as a Christian, and I've learned from studying, and especially as a pastor, but I still remember after the Lord saved me about three years later in the Free Will Baptist Church, the pastor called me, he was going out of town, and I was faithful, I was all, whenever church was open, I was there. And he asked me to do Wednesday night Bible study, and I told him no. And then as I was reading the next morning, Judges chapter 6, 7, 8, was about Gideon, God said, I'm calling you to preach my word. And I told God, no. I've used this in my sermons a few times, but I really haven't said what else I told God. I told God, and I said, no. And I told God, I'm not a speaker. Now remember, I didn't know the Bible. I didn't know about Moses and some other people. All I knew is I told God, no. And then I told God, I am not a speaker. I can't speak in front of people. And then I also told God that I'm a follower. That's why whenever I got in trouble, when my friends got in trouble, I was with my friends, I followed them. We got in trouble together. I was a follower. And God was persistent. Now I understand probably the hounds of heaven and dealing with God and not letting me go through his word and his Holy Spirit. That day, he said, I'm going to call you to preach my word. And he promised to be with me, and he promised to go before me. And little did I know, only as I look back at various times and various situations and what's happened to me in my Christian life in various churches as pastor and to this very day, how he has not only gone before me, but he's been with me and taken care of me. And he says, if you preach my word, I will be with you. And that's why I'm still here to this day, the age of 70. I love preaching. I love speaking God's word because he has empowered me. He is with me and he still goes before me. No greater feeling than that, knowing that I am doing God's will, and you learn. And there were a few other times in my life as I learned. I told God no, but what happens is you learn that he is Lord, and you learn between the, the woodshed and how he deals with you. There are times he's been very merciful, and other times he's very stern. 
Sometimes you get grace and sometimes you don't get grace. God wants you to conform to his will, to be like Jesus. And that's what he expected of me. To pick up my cross, deny self, and follow Jesus. And there are times it is difficult. There are times you're going to say, wow, I don't know if I can do this. And we can't do this within ourselves. That's why we need the power of God's word, the power of his Holy Spirit each day. That's why prayer and Bible study is so important, so that we can learn to be more like Jesus. That's why the resurrection is so important. That resurrection power from Philippians 3.10, oh man, I may mean, know him. And the power of his resurrection. How am I here today? And why am I still preaching? Because of the power of God working in me. And I understand that passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, where God says, I choose, he is God has chosen the foolish things, the despising things, the lowly things. I really understand that now because I would have never called me to preach. And I didn't know why God did it. But I do understand some things of God because he's chosen the foolish things of this world. And I did many foolish things before I was saved and a few after. Try to keep that at the bare minimum. And I understand God chooses those things that the world will choose. And I love that. And I'm thankful for His grace and mercy, which still is upon me, my family, and this church, Northfield Hills Baptist Church. We hope to see you next week here in live as we resume our live services next Sunday. Let us bow our heads as we close in the word. Almighty oh, God, thank you for the sweet and tender graces and the tender mercies you continually give upon us, even when we don't see things your way. But your long suffering and compassion and mercy is upon us. Help us to be more like Jesus. Give us that strength that comes from your Holy Spirit and your mighty word. Help us today, Lord God. There is no one like you, a God who forgives sins. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for today. In Jesus Christ, we ask these things. Amen.